over the last number of weeks, we've been looking at themes from this book, uh, which is entitled The Inconceivable Emancipation, a book by my teacher, Sangar Akshita. And uh, the book itself is a commentary on a very ancient, traditional Indian text called the Vimlakirti Nadesha. Uh, and um, tonight I was meant to, uh, I was billed as um, carrying on looking at a particular theme from this text called the mystery of human communication. Uh, but I, I've decided not to, so you'll have to forgive me. I don't think it was actually advertised, so uh, hopefully you won't be too disappointed. Um, I want to um, in a way, use the opportunity of um, the text to, to jump off uh, in, in my own direction. Um, the text, the Vimlakirti Nidesha, is, amongst other things, it's concerned with um, the theme of a pure land, uh, uh, a Buddha land, a pure land where... Um, a pure land is, is, is uh, a land where um, all the beings in that land are on their way to enlightenment if they're not enlightened already. They're all beings who are dedicated to the attainment of perfect enlightenment. And everything in a pure land, everything around, all the conditions around, are supportive of that quest towards enlightenment. And each pure land has a Buddha uh, teaching the Dharma in whatever way uh, the beings need to be taught the Dharma. And um, in the chapter that I was going to talk about, Vimlakirti shows uh, all the people that are assembled in his house. He shows them a particular pure land. He has the ability to uh, not only um, have a vision himself of a pure land, but to share that vision with everybody around him. He sort of uh, is like a doorway into the cosmos of Imlakirti, and he opens the door into a pure land that is many, many light years away. Uh, it's said to be... Um, uh, uh, well, an inconceivable number of inconceivable number of inconceivable numbers of miles away, uh, upwards, uh, above us, uh, and um, it's a it's a land where um, there is a Buddha, and there are beings who are uh, practicing the Dharma and moving towards enlightenment. But all the teaching is done by fragrances, uh, not by words. The Buddha communicates through fragrances, through scents. The Dharma is communicated through beautiful, beautiful uh, scents that transport the beings into states of mind which are beautiful and where they realize enlightenment. So it's enlightenment through beauty and beauty through a particular sense, uh, and that sense is the sense of smell. Uh, you're transported through the sense of smell into uh, enlightenment. How wonderful, how wonderful. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that, <laughs> um, because I want to touch on um, uh, our own world, which is, from the perspective of the Vimlakuti Nidesha, our world isn't a pure land, it's an impure land. It's an impure Buddha field. And that's because all the beings in our world are not enlightened or heading towards enlightenment. Uh, there are lots of beings in our world that are actually heading in quite different quests. Uh, a lot of those quests are to do with egotism. Uh, a lot of beings aren't receptive to the Dharma. And uh, even though our world contains a Buddha, uh, the historical Buddha Shakyamuni, and uh, in a way his, his presence uh, 
that lives on in his teaching, even though our world contains a Buddha, uh, the beings, uh, or a lot of the beings, aren't receptive to the teaching of the Buddha. And he has to teach in words, not just words, but primarily his teaching is communicated in words rather than in fragrance, <laughs> uh, rather than in sense. And it's, um, it's an impure land. And I want to talk about our impure land and what do we do in this impure land to try and move it towards a pure land. And that feels particularly pertinent at a time in a week where we've had a general election and uh, a result which has left us with possibly with um, more uncertainty than ever. Uh, you might have found the result positive, you might have found it uh, not positive, depending on your political um, position. Uh, but I think you'll agree that uh, a week, uh, it's a week where things have been thrown up in the air in terms of our, our political landscape, at least in this country. Uh, things have been thrown up in the air, for better and maybe for worse. Um, and of course, we're living in a, in a more, if you look more broadly, uh, there's uncertainty all around us in the world. Uh, and um, sometimes it doesn't directly impinge on us, but sometimes it does very directly impinge on us. Not just uncertainty, but um, the forces of uh, terror, war, uh, conflict of all sorts of kinds, uh, the forces of um, uh, darkness in all sorts of ways, uh, many of them uh, mind-made, human-made, and then there's also natural disasters and famines and uh, uh, people uh, with um, hellish lives in, in the world around us. So it really is an impure world, an impure land, compared to the magical, mythical worlds that are imagined in the Vimla Kirti Nidesha. Uh, but I'm going to focus on our country, mainly. Well, I am and I'm not. I'm going to try and look at how do we engage in this impure world. Uh, I can't look at that exhaustively, but I'm going to look at one particular way of thinking about um, uh, engagement. And um, as I say, I'm particularly drawn to talking about this because of our election and because our political landscape seems to be shifting. And the first thing that I want to say is that if you're uh, a practicing Buddhist, uh, you can practice the Dharma and be of um, any political persuasion uh, in our country, uh, as long as you're practicing the Dharma, which does mean ethics, and it does mean trying to work on your own mind. So, for example, you can be uh, uh, aligned to any of the political parties in our spectrum if you're also trying to practice ethics and working on your own mind. So sometimes, I think this is quite important to say because sometimes people assume, well, I've heard it assumed, that if you're a Buddhist, you're going to be left-wing uh, and you're probably going to vote Labour uh, or Green, maybe. Uh, uh, and, and many Buddhists that I know in our Sangha are indeed uh, aligned um, in that way. Uh, and that's probably where they've um, voted. Uh, but there's an, actually nothing about Buddhism that says you can't be conservative, uh, that you can't be championing uh, the Conservative Party. Theresa May uh, could be um, championed by Dharma practitioners. Yeah? Uh, so, so in a way, um, it's, it's, it's presumptuous to assume that there's only one way of aligning yourself politically or that uh, all Sangha members think the same way um, politically. Uh, 
I wouldn't assume that Sangharat Shitta voted for Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, he might have done, but I wouldn't assume that. Uh, and I know um, yeah, people in our Sangha who have quite different political positions and probably have voted Conservative in this last election and may have voted, will have voted, to leave uh, the European Union rather than remain. Yeah. And that's fine. Uh, the Sangha isn't a political party. The Sangha isn't a political party. And I think that we've really, really got to remember that because I think we can start to not only assume a particular kind of leaning, a political leaning, but also we can start to assume that the Sangha works in the same way as a political party kind of operates. Uh, and, and the Sangha doesn't. It's not a political party. It's not actually uh, any, like any other group that you or I will have come across in, in worldly terms, although it shares some common traits with other groups. Uh, so if we're not, if the, if the Dharma doesn't tell us which way to vote, which is, I mean, it's too late now anyway, because the vote was last week, uh, so it's just as well. Uh, but the Dharma wouldn't tell you which way to vote. Uh, so what can it tell you about, um, uh, about society and, and what, to, what to champion, what values to champion? Well, I think it can tell you about values. Yeah? It can't necessarily then tell you how to align those values with a particular political party, but it can tell you what values to look for. Um, at least I think it can. And I think that if we can look at values, that is a way of looking deeper at our society and about at, at um, the human condition than just defining ourselves by... Uh, political allegiances. <coughs> so there are lots of values that the Dharma offers you. Uh, and um, I'm not going to talk about many of the traditional kind of formulations. I'm going to use a, uh, uh, a framework that um, an uh, order member friend called Vidyaruchi has been thinking about. And I talked about this um, a few months ago in a talk that I gave at the Transforming Self and World Group here. Um, and it's a framework that he was sharing with me um, when we met a few few months ago. Actually, it's not entirely his framework, although it is, um, a, a, he's, he's done a lot of thinking about it, which he shared with me. The, the framework is older than Vidyarucci, it actually goes back to, um, well, it was, it was uh, the Indian social leader and reformer, Dr. Ambedkar, who came up with this framework. Uh, so Sangamani in the, in the tea break was talking about these courageous women who are currently knocking on doors, raising money for uh, some of the poorest, most deprived, most oppressed people in the world. They happen to be in India. They happen to be uh, part of the Dalit, Dalit community. Uh, and the, the reason that they're oppressed and uh, deprived is because in the Hindu caste system, they're at the bottom of the heap. The Hindu social structure, which is uh, quite a cruel social structure, at least when it comes to oppressing those at the bottom. Um, the Dalits are at the bottom of the heap. And Dr. Ambedkar was, was a Dalit. He was born into the Dalit community. But he managed through, uh, through patronage, he, he managed to get an education. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. He was educated um, here in the West, uh, in this country and in, in America. Uh, he became a doctor of law. He went back to India, and in the first Indian independent government of Nehru, he was the law minister. And he pretty much single-handedly drafted the Indian constitution, which would have been a phenomenal achievement for 
any human being, uh, but from somebody from his background, it was it was superhuman. Uh, but he wasn't just a great statesperson, uh, an extraordinary statesman. Um, he wanted to um, find a way of freeing his community, the Dalits, from the oppression of caste. And towards the end of his life, he became a Buddhist. Not only did he become a Buddhist, but hundreds of thousands of his followers, and, and today millions of his followers, became Buddhist because he became a Buddhist. And Buddhism doesn't recognise caste. Buddhism teaches that all human beings have equal potential, that just because you're born into a particular group, social group, that doesn't make you lesser. Uh, it doesn't recognise caste at all. But the Buddha didn't recognise caste. And through becoming Buddhist, uh, millions of people uh, in India have found uh, liberation. And um, Dr. Ambedkar uh, talked about the values of liberty, equality and fraternity. Liberty, equality and fraternity. But what he said was that he hadn't derived these values from the French Revolution, although they were espoused in the French Revolution. Uh, he hadn't derived them from the French Revolution. He said that he had derived them from his teacher, the Buddha. He said that you can find those values of liberty, equality and fraternity in the Dharma, in the Buddha uh, and his teachings. Um, so I want to talk about those values as a framework for thinking about how to transform our impure land into a pure land, how to engage with uh, uh, politics without uh, polarising um, in, in party political terms, how to think about uh, society um, in both as it is and where it could be, what it could become in its, in its sort of real and its ideal senses. So liberty, equality, fraternity. Um, and as I say, I'm going to base some of my thinking on uh, what Vidya Ruchi has been thinking. So thank you if you're watching Vidya Ruchi. Um, so one of the things um, uh, that, that we can say about these values uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity. I hope you can agree. Fraternity is not a, a sort of gender, gender neutral word, but you could substitute the word community uh, for it. So it could be liberty, equality, community. One of the things you, I hope you can see is that they're all good values. They're all worthy values. Uh, individual liberty, uh, equality amongst people, and a sense of community. Um, but the interesting thing is that in our impure land, in our unenlightened world, those values are always in tension with each other. They're always in tension with each other. So I want to look at some of the tension between those values. And then I want to start looking at what they might look like in, from a Dharmic perspective and therefore what they might point to, what sort of ideal society they might point to, what sort of pure land, pure world they might point to. So if you look at the values, just take the values particularly of liberty and equality, I think that you can see that uh, on the left and the right of the political spectrum, um, different values are given priority. So on the right of the political spectrum, uh, and I'm talking quite broadly now, uh, one of the real values uh, that's held up is individual liberty. The, the, the freedom to live your life that, in a way that you want to live your life. Um, from, from the perspective of uh, the Conservative Party, that would be things like minimising the interference of the state on your life, uh, minimising the amount of tax that you have to pay to the state so that you can choose what you do with your money. 
uh, encouraging individual enterprise, particularly in terms of business, allowing people to do what they want to do with their careers, uh, um, not um, holding people back in terms of um, individual initiative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pr primarily through financial intensive incentives and uh, tax cuts. Yeah, that that would be a sort of way of talking about liberty. Now you might not agree with that as a as a as a ideal, but it is trying to um, talk about individual freedom to live your life. Yeah. The trouble is that that is often at the expense of equality. Uh, so what tends to happen is that the rich get richer and the poor become more poor. And in this country you can see inequality is growing, has grown, is growing. And uh, uh, it's also sometimes at the expense of community. It's also at the expense of community. You can champion individual liberty, but uh, individuals aren't going to naturally form community unless there's some sort of encouragement. And uh, also there are enterprises like education, like healthcare, like the arts, that in a way require community. Um, as an individual, one can't just set up an education system or a school or a hospital. Do, do, do you see what I mean? We have to work together to do certain things that are socially important. So individual liberty without the other two values tends to get distorted. Do, do, do you see how that can happen? But then equality, which is often championed by the left of the political spectrum, well, that's a real value as well. Uh, that's a real value in terms of treating people equally, uh, being fair, uh, trying to minimise uh, the inequalities in society, particularly the economic inequalities, trying to particularly do that by uh, helping those at the bottom of the, of, of, of the heap to, to, to rise up, uh, uh, asking those people who are wealthiest to pay more tax in tax so that um, uh, the people who need the help the most can be helped up, etc., etc. They're, they're left leaning political kind of values. Uh, but taken to an extreme, um, equality can, um, I don't know, be championed at the expense of liberty, individual liberty. You can get oppressive uh, left leaning um, regimes like communism, which, which was trying to create a fair world Perhaps it's also trying to create a sense of community. But you weren't free as an individual. You're not free. You have to. The state is, is, is all powerful. So there you've just got a sense of liberty and equality can be intention in our, in our impure world. Yeah. With, with community, with fraternity, what happens in our impure world, I think, well, Vili Ritchie was thinking is that our sense of community is um, relatively small, narrow. Yeah? So in an impure world, we may have a sense of community, but it tends to be um, a sense of community with just people like me. Yeah? Uh, it might be limited to just my nearest and dearest, my friends and family. Or it might be a little bit wider to those that I share, I don't know, other things with, like religion or race or sexuality or, you name it, education, class, whatever it is. But they're people like me. And, and then, yes, I'll feel a sense of community with them. But anybody that is a bit too different to me is other than me and outside of my sense of community. Yeah? You can extend that to nationhood. You might, you might identify uh, with the nation, our nation, the United Kingdom, um, 
uh, even within, well, it's a, it's a United Kingdom of Nations, isn't it? So uh, you might stretch as far as the United Kingdom, or you might actually be, I don't know, limited to London or, or, or something you know, smaller. Uh, even though if it is the United Kingdom, um, uh, that definitely doesn't include the French uh, or, or those on continental Europe. Uh, in continental Europe, it doesn't include those people, uh, as we'll soon sort of see. <laughs> uh, and uh, and as for the rest of the world, well, we don't really seem to give too much of thought, uh, apart from maybe North America. Uh, so I'm, I'm slightly um, being flippant. Uh, you have to forgive the flippancy. Uh, but do you see that in our impure world, our sense of community, if it exists at all, can be tightly defined and narrow. Yeah. Um, actually, I think that uh, our sense of community is has been breaking down steadily over, I don't know, the number of decades. I'm I'm um, in my early fifties, and uh, I'm sure that even in my adult life, I've seen our sense of community being eroded. Uh, more and more towards individual liberty. Uh, our, our cu current culture, it's so hard to see, so I'm making huge generalisations, and I realise that um, they are generalisations, and you'll have to forgive the broad brushstrokes. And also, I'm in it, I'm in our culture, so I can't always see what's going on. So I'm trying to sort of give us a framework to evaluate it, but it's flawed. Um, but nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is that our cult current culture, I think, is more individualistic than it's ever, ever been. There's more sense of me and my life and I'll do what I want than we've ever had at the expense of community and social obligations and responsibility to those around us. So you've got these, these three values, liberty, equality and community or fraternity, which are... I think we are all kind of, can everybody see that, that they're good values for a human society to, to uphold? And then hopefully we can start to see in the broad brushstrokes how different political parties <coughs> might hold up one value but let others suffer. Yeah? And then you get tension and conflict and political um, polarisation. Uh, and... and the truth has to be, I think, more complex than that simple polarisation of left and right. Or, uh, yeah, in your case, left and right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much more complex than that. But let me start to look at... Um, I'm not going to pause for questions because I'm, I'm, I'm not... Um, yeah, no, let me just see if that's clear, but don't ask me anything about politics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to confuse you, but nor do I want to go into... <laughs> I'm way out of my comfort zone, folks. <laughs> so, so just nod benignly. Good. <laughs> good, good, thank you. So um, <laughs> I'm going to move back into uh, a more of my sort of comfort zone, which is to look at it from a Dharmic perspective, look at these dharmic, uh, these values from uh, a more dharmic perspective, yeah? Um, so if you take liberty, uh, well, the Dharma, the Buddha taught that the Dharma is all about freedom. He, he, he says in the Dharmapada that, uh, in the Udana, sorry, that um, uh, his teaching has one taste, it has the taste of freedom. He says, just as the ocean all over the world has one taste and it's a taste of salt, his teaching, the Dharma, has one taste. Uh, whatever aspect of the teaching you draw on, or whichever practice you practice, it, it has one taste, it has a taste of freedom. Uh, the goal of enlightenment is said to be emancipation. This book is called The Inconceivable Emancipation. Uh, so enlightenment is very, very much about liberty, about freedom. <coughs> but it's not freedom in the sense uh, uh, that 
our politicians tend to define it. Um, the Buddha was talking about an inner freedom. It's not, from a Buddhist perspective, freedom to do what you want. It's a freedom from the bonds that tie down consciousness, the bonds, the fetters that tie our minds down, the bondage of uh, the mind. Uh, and those bonds are the bonds of greed and hatred and delusion. And those bonds keep our consciousness small. So small um, that we are imprisoned by them. The tragedy is that we don't know, much of the time we don't know that we're imprisoned because though that small consciousness, that small mind is all that we're, we've ever been used to. So we don't know that that is imprisonment. Uh, you don't actually know that you're imprisoned until you start to glimpse freedom. Yeah, that's just how it is. If this is how we're born, we don't know any different until we start to experience the difference. And hopefully, if you've been meditating and practicing for any length of time, you've started to experience that your mind can be bigger, more free, that there's more choice in, in your in your experience, choice as to how you want to how you want to behave, but also what sort of mind state you want to inhabit. So something unfortunate happens in your life and you don't have to be swamped by it in your mind. Uh, you don't have to give in to uh, hatred or depression or envy or whatever it is, resentment. Buddhism teaches us that there is a freedom of mind. Actually, it's the only real freedom that's on offer. Uh, a freedom where we can choose to respond creatively no matter what happens externally to us. So that's the liberty that the Buddha is particularly teaching. Yeah. I guess there is a social liberty that is needed for that. Uh, uh, there are countries in this world uh, where you are not free to practice Buddhism. You probably would be imprisoned for practicing Buddhism. Even, I think, in Turkey, uh, these days it would be illegal to be openly Buddhist. And it, you, you might get into trouble for meditating. Uh, particularly if that was seen as religious, Buddhist religious. You might get away with somehow uh, something like secular mindfulness or something, I don't know. But there are countries quite close to us where uh, the Dharma isn't an option, at least openly. So I think we're very, very fortunate to live in a country where there's enough social freedom to practice Buddhism, to practice the Dharma. There is freedom to choose what sort of life that we want. And I think we need to uh, jealously defend that freedom against any sorts of um, uh, uh, threats to that freedom. If, if any sorts of um, political or social group is advocating uh, um, a reduction in our freedom to believe whatever we want to believe, to have whatever views we want to have, and to practice whatever religion we want to practice, then I think we need to, to, to really defend that freedom. I think we need to defend freedom of thought and freedom of speech um, very, very uh, um, uh, strongly. Not from a basis of anger, but just from a basis of realizing the preciousness of that value, of that freedom. Yeah. Unfortunately, without a dharmic perspective, what happens is that liberty, freedom, is um, reduced to just doing what I want. Yeah? Uh, if I don't have a dharmic perspective, if I don't have any idea of a bigger consciousness, 
of the possibility of a, of a freer mind, then my notion of freedom will tend to boil down to doing whatever I want. And in the culture that we live in, the more money that I have, the more I can do what I want. Yeah? So then it boils down to just getting as much money as I, I can and, and, and buying as much and consuming as much and spending as much. And you can see how the, the very notion of freedom just gets reduced to greed. Yeah, re greed and consumerism and um, uh, yeah, uh, doing what I want with my small little mind uh, going on holiday wherever I want. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's seen as, as freedom. So do you see that there's a whole spectrum from a very, very dharmic, lofty notion of enlightenment, a whole spectrum of what freedom means, right down to I'm free to spend as much as I want. Yeah. So equality, I want to move on to equality. What does equality mean in a, from a dharmic perspective? Any ideas what equality might mean from a Buddhist perspective, what the Buddha would make of that, that value. What's ultimate about equality from a Buddhist perspective? All, have, uh, all sentient beings have the same potential. Of all yeah, liberation. that's right. All sentient beings, that's exactly right, have the same equal potential for liberation. All sentient beings... Uh, and particularly the Buddha talked about human consciousness and human beings as having the potential to become enlightened. Human consciousness has that potential within it. Because what keeps us unenlightened is a delusion. So if it's a delusion, it's, it's a false assumption. And it's always possible to shed your delusion. In any moment, it's possible. Because the delusion is an extraneous thing that we've added on to experience. So it's always possible to, to shed it. It's always possible to um, tear the veil of delusion asunder and see things as they are. All human consciousness has that potential. Yeah. At least when it's functioning healthily. Um, so I guess consciousness can be impaired through mental disability or even physical disability. Uh, and then maybe uh, it's not possible to shed the delusion. But if it's a healthy human consciousness, then uh, the, the potential is there for uh, becoming a Buddha. All human beings share that potential. I guess Buddhism would go further and say, even if in this lifetime someone was born with uh, faculties that meant that they weren't going to be able to become a Buddha. This lifetime is only one lifetime in a in a huge, much bigger context of lifetimes, uh, and that potential is eternal. That potential is is in consciousness itself. So the other thing about equality that is interesting is that um, what that no one of the things, for example, that implies is a respect for all human beings and, in fact, for all life. Uh, a, a profound respect for all life. Um, a, a valuing of life just as life, not because um, you happen to agree with that person or like them even, but they're another human being who is actually a potential Buddha. Uh, and, and there's a profound respect, even um, uh, um, reverence for life. Yeah. But what equality in a Buddhist sense doesn't mean is that everybody has realized that potentially equally. It doesn't mean that everybody is at the same stage of the journey towards enlightenment. Because if there is a path from unenlightenment to enlightenment, if there's a journey, then some people are going to be further along on that path than others. So Buddhism doesn't say that all beings have realized their potential equally. Some people haven't realized their potential 
as much as other people have realized their potential. The image that the Buddha had and he used um, uh, was of um, uh, a bed of lotuses in a lake. The, the image that's illustrated on these hangings is seeing all humanity, all human beings, like lotus flowers that have the potential to bloom and blossom and fully open. But at any one time, he saw that different lotuses were at different stages of growth and that some were quite um, uh, um, uh, closed and underwater and, and little buds, really. Others had um, started to uh, just break the surface of the water and, and had, had grown uh, to the point where they were starting to flower. And then others still had come clear of the water and had fully open, uh, had become fully open lotus flowers. Uh, I love that image because what you get in that image at the same time is this equality of potential, this profound respect for all beings because of their potential, and an acknowledgement that beings will be at different stages of unfoldment of that potential. So equality without that dharmic perspective, without seeing equality in terms of our equal potential for enlightenment, what would equality mean without that? What does it get reduced to? Yeah, so that would be, in a way, the, the, the sort of false or, or, or less positive side. The positive side, I guess, would be you could have equal, equal of op, equality of opportunities in a social sense, where, where everybody is offered uh, um, equal social opportunities, and, and, and the opportunities, um, say, of education, of healthcare, of jobs aren't dependent upon how much money your family happen to have. That would be an equality of opportunity. But you're, you're right that equality in a, in a sort of false sense would be to uh, assume that everybody had the same capacity, yeah? uh, the same um, uh, unfolding of talents, because that's just not true. Some people do have more capacity in lots of different areas than, than others. Um, uh, some people are great musicians uh, and artists, and not everybody is going to be. Yeah? Uh, I could play the recorder when I was a kid, uh, <laughs> the treble and the descant, uh, and I was pretty good for a seven-year-old, but I was never going to be uh, a great musician. Um, you know, I was never going to do it. Uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, but some people will. Some people will have natural talent, won't they, in, in that arena. Um, so, so I think it would be a sort of false teaching to assume that everybody is equal in all spheres of their life in terms of their capacities and talents. Uh, because to assume that would be to dumb everything down and not allow individual talents to unfold in their own way. Yeah. Uh, we're not all the same. We're not all the same. Another teaching, another beautiful image uh, that the Buddha gave was of um, the Dharma as a cloud of rain, a rain cloud that rains down on, on the land, on the parched land. And, and the, the, the rain as it, as it comes, it's a monsoon rain in India, you know, the, the, the land has been thirsty for months. The rain comes down and everything starts to, to grow. Uh, and and the, the image that the Buddha had was that the rain falls equally on all the plants. It's the same rain falling equally on all the plants. But the plants are all different. And they will all grow in their, their different ways. 
So a blade of grass will never become an oak tree. Yeah? Uh, it doesn't mean it's any less beautiful or worthwhile, but it's not the same. Uh, so, so the Buddha allowed for equality of growth and opportunity and, and potential without assuming that everything was, everybody was the same either in their stage of unfoldment or even um, even if they're spiritually very, very mature. So if you got, I don't know, if you become enlightened and I become enlightened in some pure land, if Surya Dutta becomes enlightened and Sanjay becomes enlightened in this life, assuming that they're not already. Forgive me for assuming that. <laughs> of course, they might be, and I wouldn't know. <laughs> Let's just take it for, for now that Sanjay's not enlightened, and Suridutta's not perfectly enlightened, even though she's pretty impressive. <laughs> they will be different in their enlightenment. They will manifest their enlightenment in different ways, because they will each have their unique qualities. Uh, so, so equality in this uh, Buddhist sense doesn't mean everybody being the same. It means equal potential and individual expression. Yeah. So again, we need to, I think, guard against doctrines or teachings or, v or views that say everybody is the same in their capacity. That's quite different from saying there's equality of opportunity. That's, that's fairly straightforward, isn't it? People can be different and still share uh, potential. And lastly, uh, I want to look at fraternity or community. And um, from an enlightened perspective, what would this look like? What would the ideal of community, of fraternity, of what would it look like from an enlightened perspective in a pure land? You'd certainly and share values. ethics. Yeah, you'd certainly share ethics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. What else? And teachings, yeah. Very yes, I think that that I think um, goes even deeper than just sharing ethics and teachings. Can you say more about about that? Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. So I think that there would be um, universal loving kindness. Um, like the ideal in the fifth stage of the Metabhavna, if everybody in the world could embody the ideal of the fifth stage of the Metabhavna. So everybody felt universal love for everybody, for all life. That would be the ideal, the pure land. The, the, the pure land would be characterized just by um, metta, maitri. Yeah. I, 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 I once had a um, dream a few years ago. Occasionally I've had um, dreams that have felt particularly significant. Uh, you know how you have big dreams and big dreams are, are different not just in uh, content but in quality they feel like they have a different feeling to them you know you're in a big dream when you're in a big dream uh, uh, you're, you're not just dreaming about your boss or, or <laughs> Theresa May or whatever it is, you're, you're in a much bigger space, a mythic space with a profound truth to it. And in this big dream, um, uh, I was being shown round um, a, a, a realm, a land, um, which when I woke up I realised was a pure land. Uh, I was being shown round it by, there was a guide, and now I don't remember much about the guide, but I was definitely a visitor. I didn't live there. I didn't 
belong there. But for some reason, I was granted the privilege of being shown around it, uh, allowed to visit it. And um, it was... Um, I don't remember the, 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 the visual sense very much, apart from I remember there were gardens, and it was beautiful. Um, uh, I remember it was um, also full of light. Um, the people were beautiful, uh, but they seemed radiant. Everybody seemed radiant. Um, I remember... Uh, this has got nothing to do with what I'm trying to talk about, but it is my dream. <laughs> uh, I remember looking up and um, seeing a red, uh, well, kind of a red light in the sky uh, that got bigger and bigger as it came towards me. It was coming towards me. And it gradually took uh, shape, and it was a shape of a fire-breathing red dragon made of light. And it was coming towards me and then sort of swooped towards me, down towards me, uh, breathing its fire-breathing thing, breathing fire. <laughs> and uh, and I, um, I should have been scared, but I wasn't. Uh, I was entranced and um, struck with sort of wonder. And because I wasn't scared, it sort of... Um, just as it should have consumed me in flames, it sort of disappeared into a, into a ball of light that landed in my hand as this red something, really. Uh, I don't even know what it was, just this red ball of light, I guess. And, and, and my guide said, oh, that's really auspicious, that you, you, you would, you know, most people would have been scared, but because you weren't, you've been given a gift. Um, which I don't know what it was. But anyway, uh, 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 um, the, the main point I was going to make is that in this pure land, uh, the, the main feeling I was left with was there was love. Uh, there was metta, maitri, uh, everywhere. And it wasn't just that the people were kind. They were, I mean, incredibly loving it was that the very air that you were breathing, if you were breathing air, was love. It was palpable. It was as if the whole land was, was meta, made manifest, made into form. Everything was light and love made into form. And it was so tangible. That was the main sense I was left with when I woke up. I could still remember breathing love. I could remember what that felt like. And, and at times, years later, if I'm meditating, I can still remember the dream. Not the details, but the love. And uh, it connects me with, with, uh, with the ideal of metta. So yes, from a, from a dharmic perspective, community, fraternity would be sangha. It would be sangha as at its highest, which would be uh, characterised by uh, love, by Maitri, everywhere. That's what we're trying to do. Imagine that when we're trying to do the Metta Bhavna. We're trying to, through our imagination, bring that world into being. Yeah? Uh, it is possible to imagine a world. And if you imagine a world, it becomes... Uh, a little closer to reality, you start to manifest that world. If, if enough of us imagined the pure land vividly enough, we would manifest it. It would manifest amongst us. In a way, that's what this Sangha is trying to do. That's what Bhante's vision was. That was what Dr. Ambedkar's vision was, is can we manifest a world together? And of course, of course we fall short. I mean, we fall so far short that it's slightly embarrassing even to talk about manifesting a world because it's just a few of us uh, in a world which mostly doesn't share our values. But nevertheless, 
it's worth striving for. Uh, I, I, I really feel that in uh, this Sangha, I mean the London Buddhist Centre, but I mean more widely our Tri Ratna Sangha, there's um, a glimpse of a glimpse of a new world. And it manifests when enough of us get together and practice together and relate on the basis of metta. When we do that, we create a little, little microcosm of a pure land. And in that pure land, there's hope. Even if it's a microcosm, there's hope. There's hope for more of us realizing <coughs> our true human potential, which is to become Buddhas. Yeah? And in that pure land, in that pure land, these values of liberty and equality and community, they don't compete. They're, they're not in competition like they are in that impure land where, I don't know, if you value liberty, it'll be at the expense of equality or equality at the expense of liberty. In this new way of being, in this microcosm of a pure land, liberty, equality and fraternity or community are equally manifest. So you've got individuals who are not coerced in any way, they're not oppressed in any way, they're free to be whoever they are and free to realise their, their deepest and highest potential. And they are realising that. So the freedom isn't just an external freedom, it's an internal freedom from greed and hatred and egotism and the delusion of egotism. So there's real, real freedom. Because it's free of greed and hatred and of the delusion of egotism, there's a, there's, a, um, there's a blurring, even a dissolving, of the boundaries between self and other. There's a dissolving of me and mine versus you and yours. So when that dissolution of self and other happens, uh, there isn't competition. Do you see what I mean? There, is no, there, there isn't power and there isn't competition. There is real equality that's supported. Uh, and there's real, uh, real wisdom and love combined. Um, power has no place. It's replaced by love. The, the, the relationship between people is defined by love rather than power and competitiveness. So you have equality, equality of potential and a support to, be, to have your potential realised without dumbing down difference or, or, or um, making everybody the same. And you have uh, love that flourishes, that allows that potential to flourish and supports everybody to flourish. In that pure land, liberty, equality and fraternity or community are all true values held up equally. And I think that our job as Dharma practitioners is to practice so that we realise that that world, we build that world as much as we can amongst us, amongst those that also share our values. That means really working on ourselves, first of all, because as long as we're bound by greed and the hatred and our delusion, <coughs> we're not going to be able, or to the extent that we're bound by those, we're not going to be able to contribute to the building of this new world. So it means working on our own minds, and it means contributing to the life of the Sangha. That means helping each other, that means giving to the life of the Sangha, it means uh, supporting the, the creation of this new world of Sangha. Yeah. It means knocking on strangers' doors so that you can raise money, so that you can give that money to the most oppressed people uh, in the world. Uh, that, that's part of it. It means uh, helping out at classes. It means even if that helping out is um, just being willing to do the hoovering at the end of the class. It means uh, helping on retreats if you can. Going on retreat yourself and then helping others to go on retreat or to have a retreat. 
Uh, it means uh, giving money, if you can, to the project of creating Buddhist centres and helping people um, practice the Dharma. Uh, it means doing whatever you can to help create this world. But that's not enough, because most of the world outside us doesn't believe in the Dharma, isn't trying to practice the Dharma, not explicitly anyway. They may, they may share some of our values, but they're not explicitly trying to uh, aim for enlightenment. So then what it means is that together we try and have as positive an influence on that wider world as we can. Yeah? So we help people as much as we can, we help that world as much as we can, through, well, speaking out and defending those values that are important to us, uh, through acts of kindness and generosity where we exemplify our Buddhist practice and, and help, uh, help, in a way, preserve those values in the world through, through practicing them. Uh, and it means um, trying to uh, open the door of Sangha to as many people as want to walk through it. So Sangha, if it's real Sangha, keeps growing. It can't be a club where you and I have found the Dharma, so we're happy and we're all right. We have to keep reaching out to people who might be open to the Dharma and haven't yet found it. We have to keep reaching out, and, and, and for our sake, but also for theirs. So if we do that, then even though we're not in a pure land, we're not in this um, ideal world, we are in an impure land surrounded by forces of greed and of hatred and of delusion. What it does mean is that our lives are contributing in a positive way to transform that world. If we're doing that, then then you can also make sense of the political system. You can choose what's needed at this moment. Is it more of an emphasis on liberty? Is it more of an emphasis on equality? Or is it more of an emphasis on community that's needed? Then lobby your politicians in that direction. Do you see what I mean? Uh, uh, and, and, and I guess uh, align yourself with, with whatever political grouping is moving in that direction the most. But don't be uh, simplistic about it, because all three values are important. All three values are, uh, are vital. But if we are doing both, um, both those things, i.e. working on ourselves and trying to work on the world around us, then even though it's a huge task, even though it feels like a kind of, at times, impossible task. I think that it's um, a task that is, um, well, A, there's hope, uh, and it feels worthwhile, even if the goal isn't reached. Because even in the striving, we'll make a better world. Yeah, Even if we can only reach a few people will have improved some lives. And that feels worthwhile doing uh, just for its own sake. It feels worthwhile trying to practice the metta bhavana and embodying love, even if we can't convince everybody that that's what they should be doing. Yeah? We need to be doing that. We need to take responsibility for our own lives and for our effect on the world around us. And then I think you could just say you've, you're living a meaningful life and there's fulfilment in that even if we can't completely transform this impure land into a pure land. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.